Now, if you want to know where I stand on my eschatology, I'm a very optimistic amillennialist and a very pessimistic postmillennialist. Now, if you got that joke, you may be a little frustrated about this sermon today. Because that means you already have some preconceived notions about what this text is going to be. If you did not get that joke, you're going to love the day. You're going to be the greatest text ever. But if you did get that joke, it's going to be a little stressful for you. Just to let you know, um, Derek Thomas, who is a, an amazing theologian, probably one of the best in the world, believes that Luke is not just speaking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. He also believes that there's a bit of... Jesus is talking about his return. But one of his good friends, Sinclair Ferguson, who is also one of the greatest theologians, says, you're wrong, Derek Thomas. I believe this passage in Luke is only talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, they're both still friends, but they disagree. Um, everyone believes that Luke believes in the second coming. The question is, is he talking about the second coming, or in context, is he just speaking to the people about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? Now, I'm of the opinion, when you read the Olivet Discourse through the eyes of Matthew, I can't see how he's not talking about the second coming, because he's separating the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25 is pretty evident. But when you come to Luke's section of the Olivet Discourse, I believe the context is right around verse 32, and you will read that as we read it. You will see that this generation is going to be able to see the destruction that's going to take place. So I believe it is fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple and the city. Now, where I throw my cards on the table, I get to preach from that. Though I do believe he's using this as an example to tell us to be ready for that cataclysmic event when Jesus returns. So, that's just the introduction to the sermon. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of debate on this. So let's go to the Lord and let's ask Him to teach us. Not just so we can say, hey, I know what my eschatology is, I think other people are wrong, but to say, what can I learn from this? When I walk out of the doors, how can I apply this to my life? How can I be a different person? Let's ask the Lord to do that for us today. Let's go to the Lord and let's ask Him to bless the preaching and the reading and what we learn. Father, we come before You and we come to a very debated topic, very debated chapter. But Father, no one debates that You will return. You are going to come back to this earth, bodily form, and You will call Your people from all around to Yourself Father, the new heavens, the new earth will, will exist. We will have resurrected bodies. We'll be able to hug and eat and enjoy one another. And Father, you have given us signs and you have told us about many things. And this passage, Father, is one that is debated. But Father, please give us hearts and minds to see this text, how it can apply to us today. Learning is great. I'll be the first to admit I enjoy discussion of eschatology, Father, but may we see this for us. Please speak to us. May someone who doesn't know you today, may their hearts be changed. For those that do know you, may they be assured that you are a good God and that you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 5. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? What will be the sign that these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of war, wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in the various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Before this, they will lay their hands on them and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. 
Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, and not a hair on your head will perish, but you, your endurance will gain you your lives. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be like captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs and sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress and nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. People fainting with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on in the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawn near. He told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out and leave, you see yourselves and know that the summer is already here. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. It will come upon all who dwell in the face, the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Thus is the reading of the very words of God. I don't have a ton of memories growing up of going to church every single time the doors were open. But as a young child, I do remember one time going to church because the church was holding a prophecy conference. Now, if you really want to fill the church with a lot of people, you hold a prophecy conference. People want to go to church to the prophecy conference. And when you hold this prophecy conference, the people that come in, the majority of people, will be holding their Herald camping books that said Jesus is going to return on May 11, 2011. Now, his book, Where Jesus Returns in 1994, doesn't get as much airtime anymore. And probably we'll write a new one where people will want to see when Jesus is going to return. You would have people at this conference carrying their John Hagee books about the blood moons and the judgment day is coming upon Israel and the Israel countdown. Of course, you'll have people bring in timelines and charts, right? Timelines and charts. They want to know how everything fits into the timeline of the charts and the lay them out on the pew or, or the seats. And this, it's going to be a big chart. And of course, the last person that will show up will be the one that has all 12 volumes of the Left Behind series highlighted and underlined. And though we laugh, there's one thing that all of them will agree on. They don't agree about anything. They're disagreeing about so much. And I don't want to be snarky toward those people who like their timeline and charts. Some of them are very very sincere biblical scholars. They're serious about what they believe. They read the scripture and they love the Lord. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. But you need to understand there's a lot of debate and mystery and lack of knowledge when it comes to prophecy. One of the reasons there's so much debate and one of the reasons there's so much um, issues and debate and mysteries because Jesus says concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, and His humanity, but the Father alone. And at the same time, He tells us to discern the times. And to interpret the times. Luke has said this in Luke 13, to interpret the times. 
So we don't know, but at the same time, we're trying to interpret the times. And there's problems when we come to prophecy. And a couple of problems we have is all of us have this presupposition of what we believe. Some people already have it, I believe this, and when I come to Scripture, how does this passage fit into what I believe? Now, I'm not here to change your presupposition on how you read eschatology here today. One of the greater problems is when we read prophecy, we try to fit what's happening in today's culture into prophecy. Now, the church has been doing this for years. When Nero was ruling and reigning, they thought Nero was the Antichrist. They thought this is the end of the world. This is it. Jesus is coming. When Muhammad was fighting, for the land of Jerusalem. You can read history and you'll see this is the end. This is the big win. It's done. Muhammad is the Antichrist. You see it throughout history when the Reformation was taking place. Leo the Tenth, Pope Leo the Tenth, he is the true Antichrist. It's all over. It's the end of the world. And you see that in the modern times, people thought Hitler was the Antichrist. They put Hitler in their time charts. They can go to trough if you're a little older. You remember those days. Um, Henry Kissinger, because he was a Jewish um, man who was a politician. And no telling which president is the Antichrist now if you brought a chart. We can't take what we see today and try to fit it within Scripture. I think we forget so many times that Scripture is written to a group of people. What we're going to read today and what we're going to learn today was written to a group of men who were about to go out and be martyred. It was written to a group of people who were about to have everything they knew and everything they loved destroyed. They loved their land. God made a covenant with them in this land. He gave it to them. He gave them the temple. He told them to build it. He said, worship me here. And it's all about to be destroyed. So come to this passage with humility. When you speak about prophecy, let's speak with humility, knowing that there are a lot of different opinions. Now, if you're taking notes, the first thing we're going to see is that the temple will be destroyed. First thing you're going to see, Jesus is going to talk about the destruction of the temple. The second thing we're going to see is that Jerusalem the great city is going to be destroyed. And the third thing we're going to see is this missing point. I think it's a major point of the passage that everyone sometimes just glosses over as if it doesn't exist. So the temple, Jerusalem, and the missing point. Now we come to the first part of the sermon where we look at the destruction of the temple and you need to understand the context is that there was disciples and they were looking at the temple and it was grand. The historian Tacitus said that Herod's temple was a temple of immense wealth. It was glamorous. God said build a temple. If you read the book of Haggai, you know they had problems with it. But it was a trailer park compared to the first temple. So Herod wanted to beat himself up politically, so he expands it to this massive, massive temple. And the Jews were like, yes. Look at our temple. Look at it go. Look how amazing it is. And in verse 5, and while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offering, and how, how amazing it was, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the this, this splendor, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Every single stone in this temple will be destroyed. Josephus tells us it got so hot that it melted the gold. When it was being burned, it melted the gold. That's one of the reasons they were turning the stones over. There was so much gold everywhere that it turned every single stone over to get the gold that was underneath there. They were looting this temple of all its rubies and everything that was there. And when Jesus said that, you need to understand that what these men thought, they thought this is This is the big one. This is when Jesus is going to return. I'm going to get everything that we, we, we saw and we heard about. This is it. This is it. This is bigger than the flood. 
Jesus is coming. It will all be destroyed. The temple was who they were. This is who they were. And if you read the book of Matthew, read the book of Mark and the Olivet Discourse, it says that after Jesus said it was going to be destroyed, he goes out of the temple and he sits at the Mount of Olives. This is why they call it the Olivet Discourse. And he's looking back at the temple in Jerusalem. And Mark 13 says, Peter, James, John, and Andrew come in privately. And they ask the question that I would have asked and that you would have asked. If this is the end of the world, when is it going to happen? I need to know when. Give me some signs. I'd like to know when the end of the world is going to take place. You see in verse 7. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Now, of course, Jesus doesn't tell them when. If Jesus told them when, they would wait to that last minute to start doing things right. Just as you and I would if we knew when the Lord would return. We say we would, but we really would. We want to get things right into that last minute. So Jesus is going to tell us how to win. But he says in verse 8, he says, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am me, and the time is at hand. Did you know there were so many false messiahs from the time that Jesus said this to the time of AD 70 when the temple was destroyed? If you read the book of Acts, that is was one of them. He was claiming to be somebody. Judas the Galilean was claiming to be somebody. We know that Menahem of Judah had thousands and thousands of followers in AD 66. Before the temple was even destroyed, just as Jesus said, people were going to be coming to them saying, I am me. He's telling them, don't follow those people. I'm the Messiah. Now, does that have application for us? Absolutely. If someone comes today and says they're Messiah, you say, whoa, 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 this is already been tried. It's already been tried one time. I was warned about this, that people would do that. But the immediate context are these people. But the application is, no one else can be the Messiah if Jesus is the Messiah. He says, don't go after them. Verse 9, and when you hear wars and tumults, don't be terrified. Listen. I was in small group on Wednesday night. If you're on a small group, this is my plug. Go to one. It's an amazing thing. I love our small group. Um, if you don't like the small group, you come to mine. We're great, right? They're all welcome. Um, and we got on the topic of the end times. I don't know how we got on the topic of the end times, but hearing the stories of people telling that they were afraid growing up. They heard these stories of people just leaving the world and vanishing and they were afraid that they would go in and their parents' clothes would be on the bed and they were like, I don't want this to happen. Children, please listen to me. Don't be afraid. Jesus loves the little children. He will take care of you. He loves you. Eschatology is not supposed to be scary. It's supposed to give us hope. It shouldn't be scary. Tara Isabella Burton, in her Vox article, wrote about this anxiety, this eschatology anxiety, which explores the many ways in which evangelicals have experienced anxiety and trauma because of this view that people are just going to vanish. You shouldn't be afraid. He says, don't be afraid. He's writing this to warn them about what's going to take place. He's going to tell them what to do to get out of it. And eschatology should give us hope. You know, I want you to think about the book of Revelation. It's written to a church that couldn't go home and just tell people they love Jesus. Their Jewish friends and families, they said, we don't believe Jesus the Messiah. We don't like you very much. Get out of our house. Okay, I'll go to my secular friends, the Romans. We don't like you either. You deny our gods. They couldn't go anywhere without being hated. Nero was lighting him up like a candle. They are going through immense suffering and persecution. And they read the book of Revelation and they go, Jesus wins. Praise the Lord. Jesus wins. What hope he gave them. And I guarantee you, 
a suffering Christian in China and a man or a woman who's come to the Lord in Iran reads the Olivet Discourse in the book of Revelation much differently than you and I do in America. Oh, they want Jesus to come right now. The imprecatory prayers, and we're like, bashing the teeth of people that know you bash the teeth of those men who are killing people in my family for loving Jesus, God. They're praying. We've got to read our scriptures, not as just as Americans. We can't change who we are. I love this country. But we are a church together. The church worldwide goes through pain and suffering and persecution. And Revelation was a book of hope. They loved the book of Revelation in the early church because Jesus wins and it's so clear that Jesus wins. Eschatology should give you hope. It should terrify you. And Jesus says, don't be terrified for these things must first take place but the end will not be at once. He's saying, now the destruction of the temple is going to take place but there's some things that must happen before they take place. You understand what Jesus is saying here? The destruction of the temple is going to take place. They don't know when. Jesus knows when, but he didn't tell them. And he said, before AD 70, these things must take place. What Matthew calls these things in Matthew 24 are birth pains. These are merely birth pains, the beginning of what is going to take place. There's some things that are going to hurt before the destruction takes place. And we see this in verse 10. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. You know what's fascinating about these verses? All of them. It was not just fulfilled in secular history, like the great earthquake in 66 that destroyed Pompeii. They were actually fulfilled in the book of Acts. Think about great earthquakes. You remember Paul and Silas had a great earthquake. Not only that, famines. Remember Agabus in Acts 11? prophesying that the great famine would come upon the nation of Rome. Pestilences. Remember all the entire chapter 5 and 6 was all these very sick people bringing them to the apostles and he's healing them. Terrors and great signs from heaven. Have you read Acts 2 about the wonders of heaven and the signs of the earth below and the tongues? Have you read that? Signs from heaven were taking place. They will lay their hands upon you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. This happened in Acts. Peter was thrown before the Sanhedrin. He was put in prison. They were being persecuted. And of course, Paul brought before kings and governors in Agrippa and wanting to go to Rome. All this fulfilled. Not just in secular history, but actually in the book of Acts. You need to understand the context. The context is Jesus is telling them, this is going to happen to you before the temple's destroyed and it's but birth pangs. He continues to tell them in verse 13, this will be your opportunity, you apostles, to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth of wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even my parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You'll be hated for my name's sake, but not a hair on your head will perish. All the apostles, except John, he was probably died of a sickness or old age, died the death of a martyr. Imagine reading this. You know you're going to die for your faith. Imagine the comfort this would give you. That not a head on your head, not a hair on your head will perish. They will try to kill you, and they will succeed, but I'm still the God of the universe, and not a hair on your head will perish. Now, is that applicable to us today? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
no matter what the world does to us, they can't take our resurrection bodies. And they can't take our souls. He has secured that for us. It is comforting for us, but in the context, it was for them. And we see in verse 19, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. If you persevere to the end, if you stand firm in your faith, believe today is the day of salvation, not a decision that you made when you were younger, but if you believe today is the day of salvation, today is the day I believe, today is the day that Jesus is the Christ, you will gain your lives. I pray you're not giving up. <coughs> Don't give up. Keep going. Keep fighting for the faith. We come to the second part of the sermon where we see Jerusalem now being destroyed. The temple was going to be destroyed. They loved this. It's the place where they went to worship. Now Jesus is going to tell them Jerusalem is also going to be destroyed. Jerusalem was the land that all their forefathers risked their lives to purify. They had to cleanse the land so God himself can come in the land and dwell with them. They fought for this land. It wasn't just something given to them. They fought and, and went and drove the people out. It was a blessing to them. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. Gentiles came into this land to hear about God. It was a special land to them. And of all the land, Jerusalem, that mighty city that fought off Sennacherib and the Sinaites, the Assyrians, this was a very, very great city, a holy city. Jerusalem, the city of peace. And Jesus is going to tell them, no, is your temple going to be destroyed? But the entire city. We read in verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, this happened. This is how Titus, who would soon be emperor in 79, destroyed the city. His dad was the emperor at the time, Vespasian, by 19, 1960, by 69 AD. He was actually the one in charge. And he said, let's surround this city. Let's starve them out. This is how it happened. He destroyed the city by surrounding them. He says, now when you see the Roman army start to surround the city, it's time for you to go. Jesus doesn't want them to go through this. You and I don't have to worry about our city being surrounded by Roman armies. But an application is, if it is, praise the Lord. In context, he's writing, be prepared. Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. Then you know that his desolation has come near. Now the question is, is this the same abomination of desolation that is spoken of in the Holy Discourse in Matthew and in Mark? I believe that it is a play on this. I don't believe that the abomination of desolation, if you would follow me here, was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. I don't believe that's what it's speaking about. What I believe this is speaking about, and I'm not the only one, is the decommissioning of the land. The one time this land was supposed to be the holy land of God, which you were supposed to be a light to the nations, people were supposed to come to you, but this desolation has come. Your land no more is the land that's going to proclaim to the nations the goodness of God and His gospel and His grace and His mercy. This is the decommissioning of the land. Verse 21, Then let those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Get out of here. This is a real warning. It's going to be bad. Get out of there. Get to the mountains. People won't try to find you there. And let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter in. Nobody should have went into that city. Titus, in his manipulation and his, and his sinfulness, said, Hey, we're having peace now. Come on into the Passover celebration. And over a million people went into that city, and all of them died because they did not listen to the warnings of Christ. Verse 22 And for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. What was written? Well, the 
Leviticus 26 makes it clear as Deuteronomy does when it shows Leviticus. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes and my ordinances, this is what I will do to you. Verse 31. I will lay waste to your cities as well as make your sanctuaries desolate. I will make the land desolate so that your enemies will settle in and be appalled over you. You don't obey me. You don't love me. You don't listen to me. Here's what I'll do. I'll destroy your land. What did you do to earn the land? Nothing. It was given to you by God. You don't want to respect the giver? You just want the gifts and the privileges? I'll do to you what it did to the Esauites and Obadiah. You'll be done. You don't want to respect the laws of God. You're done. Jesus is not making empty threats. Heaven came to earth. The kingdom came through Jesus. He was their final prophet. And he's begging them to repent, to believe. Just as Jonah did. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. What did they do? They repented. Praise the Lord. God spared Nineveh. They rejected the prophet. They rejected the final prophet. And God is going to come true on his promises. He's going to destroy the city. He's going to destroy the inhabitants of the city. And the beauty is, he's not only going to keep his promises to destroy, but he's going to keep his promises to save. See this in the ark. If you'd have listened to the preaching of Christ, we know as Peter tells us, you'd have got an ark. You'd have trusted in God's means. He will save you. He will save you if you just believe and just trust that his words are true. He will save you. He comes true in his promises to destroy, and he comes promises on his true, or he comes promise, he comes true in his promises to save. And, and I'm thinking about this. They should have been shocked. This should have been nothing new to a Jewish person. We have an entire book dedicated to destruction of the temple. The book of Lamentations was written because we think Jeremiah wrote it. He's weeping and crying. What happened to this great city? It was destroyed. And we see in Lamentations 115, the Lord has trodden as in a wine press the virgin daughter Jerusalem, which is speaking about of Judah. He's done it before. What makes you think he's not going to do it again? This is how far they've gotten away from the world. How far they've gotten away from God. They've forgotten that he's done it before. And they're not afraid. And Jesus is warning them, you need to get out of the city. It's going to be bad. Verse 23, he continues to warn them, alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, get out. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. We see in Acts, James, the brother John, died for this. We even see this fulfilled in Acts, but we see it fulfilled by AD 70. The Jews are out of the land. They're led captive among the nations. My mother worked for a man who was Jewish, his father was a rabbi, and he was Puerto Rican. Spanish Jews. You will soon meet in our church, a lady that is affiliated with us who is a Russian Jew. You go to Africa, you're going to meet African Jews. They were the captive among the nations. They were spread out. They were decommissioned. And you read in Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. The nations will come in and destroy this one time sacred city. You know the Jews loved the Temple Mount. This is the very place where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. The very place that David bought the threshing floor for the temple to be built is the very place that Solomon built the temple where the holies of holies was. Think about it. The priest couldn't go in but once a year. And you've heard the stories, whether they're true or not, of having the ropes tied to them in case they died. That's how sacred and holy this place was. 
What sits there today? A Muslim mosque. The dome of the rock. Genesis 16.2, a follower of Ishmael, one of his descendants, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. That's what sits there now. It is trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. I'm not a prophetic person, but that place ain't going easy, let me tell you that right now. It's there, it's there to stay. And God is teaching all of us a lesson. He will come true on his promises. And you see that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now if you give me just five minutes to tell you what I think this means, um, it is debated. But in context, I believe in verse 32, the people who will be around in AD 70, the one that he's warning them to get out of the city, flee Jerusalem, they're going to see the Gentiles trampling Jerusalem and they will see the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. This has nothing to do with Romans 11.25. If your brain's going there, it doesn't. I want to submit to you Romans, or sorry, Revelation 11.2. Revelation 11.2. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread under the foot of the holy city for 42 months. Now some of you are like, oh, three and a half years, that sounds real familiar, because you follow things that talk about three and a half years. Let me explain to you three and a half years. It's, it's kind of over the scripture quite a bit. Do um, you know how long it took Rome to destroy the city of Jerusalem? Don't take my word for it. Look it up. The book of Revelation is telling people for, 30, for three and a half years, you're going to go through suffering and pain. When Nero was in charge in 60 AD, the Jews had a revolt. They said, we're tired of worshiping your false gods. And they took over their nation again. And Nero's under pressure to go make sure this place is going well. And he takes Vespasian, this great general. He said, you and your son need to go down there and take over Jerusalem. You need to take over Israel again. You know what Vespasian did? Did the same thing Nebuchadnezzar did. Same thing the Babylonians did. The same thing the Assyrians did when you read the scripture. Because you can't just go to a fortified city and destroy it. You've got to start on the north side. You can't go because the Mediterranean is in the west. You've got the mountains and the desert to the east. You can't go to you know, Egypt to deal with them. They don't like you very much. So you've got to go from the north. So he did the same thing Nebuchadnezzar did. Let's start our war in Galilee. And in 67 AD, Vespasian and Titus, his son, started the war in Galilee. It took him three and a half years to completely destroy all of Jerusalem and the temple. And in the words of Bengal, the, the great master of Greek and other languages, he said, the times of the Gentiles are the times allotted to the Gentiles to tread down the sea. That's my rationale. If you have another rationale, when you're thinking 1948, feel free to take me to any lunch, dinner. Um, we will talk about it. I will eat your food and I will hear you out. And we will, I, I love talking about it. That's how I believe this happened. There's a decommissioning of the land. And to this day, we see that the Gentiles have, have stopped over Jerusalem. We continue to read in verse 25. We're going to see this apocalyptic language. Of course, it feels like the end of the world. This is what it felt like to those who were being bombed by Germany and England. Read some of their letters. This is the end of the world. This is the big one. Pearl Harbor, people thought this was the end of the world. This is what's happening. In 9 11, people thought this is the end of the world. Anytime these types of things where your, your cities are short, everything you hold dear, you think it's the end of the world. Verse 25, and there will be signs and sun and moon and stars and the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring sea 
in the waves, people fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Verse 27, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great joy. Now, Jesus loved to call himself the Son of Man. If you want to know a quick explanation of what the Son of Man is, the eternal Son was born of a virgin. He took upon himself a body. The Son of Man is the eternal Son with a human body. That's what the Son of Man is. And in Daniel 7, Daniel is looking up at this prophecy and he sees some crazy things. And in verse 13 in chapter 7, he says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And you have to ask yourself this question. Is the Son of Man in Daniel 7 referring to Jesus after he ascends into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father? Or is it Jesus in human form ruling and reigning after the big one, the end times? Those are, your, those are, your, those are the two things you have to ask yourself. I believe Daniel is speaking about the Son of Man ruling and reigning in the right hand of God after he ascends into heaven. So because that is my thought process in verse 27, speaking to people who are about to die, speaking to people who are about to have their whole world destroyed, the world that they knew, their city, their temple, the whole world's going to be turned upside down. He said, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with the power of great glory. Now when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawn now. My mind went straight to the stoning of Stephen in Acts. Do you remember when Stephen was stoned in Acts? He was martyred. He was the first martyr. They picked up stones and they put him in this little ditch and they were throwing these stones and they were busting his head open. What did Stephen say? Full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. Jesus standing in the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing in the right hand of God. Please, this is what Jesus is saying. I may be wrong, but this is the way I read it. People are going to die for their faith. Stephen died for their faith. But when you're about to die, you look up at the heavens because Jesus Christ, He's going to be there for you. Now, when you see these things begin to take place and everybody wants to kill you, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Go be with the Father. Do you see the hope that would be given to someone who's about to face death? I hope you see that hope also. We continue to read in verse 29. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out of leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. Real simple. Nothing grows in the wintertime. Grows in the spring, in the summer. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. When you see the rumors of war, when you see the waves, when you see things going on, the terribleness of this world, you know the kingdom of God is near. You may be thinking, what's well, right? That, that sounds a lot like today. You're getting the point. The kingdom of God is near. What they are going through was cataclysmic, was apocalyptic, and the kingdom of God is near. And by way of application, what happened to them is going to happen to us one day. Not that Rome's going to surround our city. We're not even in Jerusalem. But it's going to happen. The kingdom of God is near. What they go through, we go through. Jesus went through suffering, we go through suffering. But no, it is near. Verse 32, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. The wars, the surrounding of the city of Jerusalem, the temple being destroyed, you're going to see this. 100% of the time in Scripture, generation means about 40 years. For some reason, in this passage, people want to make it say something different. This is the 
of generation that people change. I'm not going to change. I believe it means generation. This generation will not pass away until all this is taking place. You're going to see it. But heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. His words are true. We come to our final point. How come people are clapping? I'm sorry. Um, Talk about the missing point. Um, I believe this is what's missed. There's so much debate about what I just said. I believe I'm right here when I said it. From humility, if you'd like to correct me, like I said, I'm more than glad to sit down and talk about it. But this is what I want you to take away. Verse 34. Watch yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Too many people live as if you have all the time in the world. We don't know when the Lord's going to return. He can return right now. This may be the last sermon you hear. Not just because the Lord's going to return. It may be because He may take you home. Oh, you're not promised to work. And we can't live as if we are. And Jesus is telling His people, Jesus knows it's right about 40 years away. He knows that. But he doesn't want them to know because they're going to live as if it doesn't matter. He wants us to live as if it matters, as if it is imminent, because it is. Verse 35, For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. It will come. This suddenness will come. He's already said it's going to come like a thief in the night. It's true for those in Jerusalem. It's true for them in the temple. It came suddenly. He says in verse 36, stay awake at all times. Pray that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. He says, you need to pray and be ready. You need to be ready. It will come upon you when you least expect it. My prayer is that none of you will ever have to flee his judgment like these men and women did. Because when you run to Christ, Christ took the judgment for us. You run to Him. You don't have to flee the city. The righteous are as well as a lion. You can run to the city now because Christ has taken your judgment. As we close, I believe one of the reasons that Luke leaves out some, and I, I don't know why when I get to heaven I've got a lot of questions. And I'm, I can't wait to sit there all day and just learn from Luke. Why he left out much of what Matthew had. Maybe Matthew's written to Jews, Luke was written to Theophilus, who was a, who was a Roman. Maybe Theophilus didn't care. But I think what Luke is doing is trying to establish to the Roman people that Jesus is a real prophet. When you read in Deuteronomy 18, what makes a true prophet? Deuteronomy 18, 21. You say to yourselves, how can we know if a message is really been spoken by the Lord? How can we know if someone's a true prophet? Verse 22. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place, then that message is not from the Lord. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alone. Don't be worried. I believe Christ fulfills Deuteronomy 18 and 20. How do you know Jesus is a true prophet? Because what he spoke about in AD 70 took place. And if you're living in AD 70, around the time Luke is writing this, I believe, in the 60s, and you get this letter, you see this take place, you're a Gentile, you're like, Jesus was a prophet. He predicted this exactly the way it happened. So therefore, I can believe everything that Jesus says because he's a true prophet. And if this came true, so is the second coming. He will return again. How can we have hope that the second coming is coming? That Jesus Christ is really going to come again? Because he's a prophet. And everything he said came true exactly the way he said it would happen. So trust in him. Love him. Don't be afraid. 
He wants to take care of you. Let's go to the Lord and let's ask Him to bless the reading and the preaching of the Word of God. Father, we come before you.